Hi and welcome to another episode of Isup's E-Lessons. Today we take a look at the poem Vultures by Nigerian poet Chinua Achebe. So once again important to know the context of the poet because he is African. We see a lot of African imagery especially in the animals that he chooses to get his message across. The title of our poem is Vultures. We know that these are African scavenger birds. They're associated with death. It starts off by saying in the grayness. So already we see the landscape that's described to us here is very colorless, very bleak. So in the grayness and drizzle of one despondent dawn, we see alliteration of the letter D here, almost creating kind of a dun 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 effect. So it, it helps to create a sense of foreboding. It adds to this dark and gloomy mood. We see the dawn is despondent, so this is personification because dawn is described as being um, hopeless, feeling miserable, and this suggests that nothing good will happen on this day. So the poem starts on quite an ominous note. Okay, so unstirred means not disturbed by harbingers. So harbingers are basically messengers. So something is undisturbed by the messengers of sunbreak, and so what's undisturbed is a vulture perching high on broken bones of a dead tree. Okay, so perching high suggests dominance or conquest. The vulture is in a position of power over the current situation. I perched high on broken bones of a dead tree. So it's very interesting to see that um, a tree which usually represents life is now described here as broken and dead. So the tree here is personified. It's described as having bones. It suggests that the vultures enjoy death. From the first few lines of stanza one, we know that it is sunrise and a vulture is perched on a lifeless tree. And we then see that he's nestled close to his mate. The term nestled close, it's an affectionate embrace. This is called a juxtaposition, where we contrast two opposites and put them together for an effect. So we see here the gentle nature of the vultures towards each other is contrasted with their grotesque nature. Okay, so he's nestled close to his mate, right? and his mate is his life partner. It suggests love and commitment. And now we see a description of the vulture. It says he's smooth, bashed in head. So bashed in is a very violent adjective to use here. It also suggests a violent lifestyle. Right? A pebble on a stem rooted in a dump of gross feathers. So we see that the poet describes the vulture as quite ugly. He uses a metaphor to describe the vulture's head to a rock on a plant stem. And then it's rooted in a dump of gross feathers. So the metaphor here continues. It's as though its head is growing out of a dirty and unhygienic place. These metaphors help us to understand the vulture is very dirty, very unattractive. So we see the description of the male vulture is very gory, it's unpleasant. He has a small ugly head, a long neck and an untidy mass of feathers. But his head is still inclined affectionately to hers. This grotesque bird lovingly leans his head against his mates. Once again, we see the contrast here because you wouldn't expect a nasty creature like this to be loving. There's a juxtaposition here between how lovingly he treats his mate and the description of this bird. Okay, so yesterday they, right? So it's as though they're a loving vulture couple. They picked the eyes of a swollen corpse in a waterlogged trench and ate the things in its bowel. Basically telling us that they ate from the dead body of an animal that was bloated due to decomposition in a waterlogged trench and any place that's waterlogged is somewhere where diseases tend to flourish and they ate the things in its bowel so the animal's excrement its droppings that were still inside its body so we see a very disgusting description of the vulture's behavior where they're described as grotesque scavengers who feed on diseased carcasses we see that full gorged they chose to roost so they overate and a roost is essentially a birdhouse so they've picked somewhere to stay for a while, keeping the hollowed remnant in easy range of cold telescopic eyes. So it tells us that they keep the remains of the corpse, whatever is left of this dead animal's body, close by. We also see that their eyes are described as cold and telescopic, so cold not in temperature, cold meaning emotionless or uncaring. Their eyes are described as telescopic, this is a metaphor because the vulture's eyes are compared to telescopes to let us know that they can see very far. So we see that stanza one highlights the contrast between these vultures who feed on the dead and decomposing animals, and yet they show affection for one another. So it's introducing this idea that evil creatures can be loving. 
The diction in the first stanza is very important. When you hear a diction, think of the word dictionary, it's referring to words. So the words here are carefully chosen to make this scene disgusting. The vultures are made out to be evil animals who feed on rotting flesh. So what's very interesting is in this poem is each stanza kind of deals with a different storyline. So stanza one dealt with the vultures. Stanza two talks about a woman. Okay, so stanza two goes on to say, Strange indeed how love in other ways so particular will pick a corner in that charnel house, tidy it up and coil up there, perhaps even fall asleep her face turned to the wall. Love is personified as a woman. What the poet is saying here, love has certain standards, maybe certain requirements of the people that she cares for. We'll pick out a corner in that charnel house. A charnel house is a vault or a building where human corpses were stored. And it's usually a place that was associated with violent deaths. But what stanza two is saying is that this woman, love, can go and live in that charnel house tidy it up, okay, make a home there, and even fall asleep, so feel safe and feel at peace. So what it's telling us is that love is personified as a woman who overlooks the horrors around her. Particularly the part where it says her face turned to the wall, that tells you that she chooses to look away from the awful things around her. She chooses not to take notice of the bad things happening around her so that she can be happy. Stanza 1 told us about the vultures, stanza 2 told us about the woman love who is personified, and stanza 3 tells us about a commandant. So it says, thus the commandant at Belsenkamp, going home for the day. Belsenkamp was a Nazi concentration camp, and we see the commandant he's referring to here. It's basically the man who was in charge at Belsenkamp. We need to understand that Nazi concentration camps were places for political prisoners and minority groups where they were held captive, they were treated terribly and when the prisoners died, they basically piled up their bodies and burned them. There was no respect shown for these prisoners, whether they were dead or alive. The officer in charge of this camp, he goes home for the day with fumes of human roast clinging rebelliously to his hairy nostrils. Telling you that bodies were burned that day and the smell is still lingering in his nose. A Nazi officer goes home to his family after he's tortured prisoners and burns their dead bodies as though it's nothing. Okay, the fumes of human roast are clinging. We see here that the fumes are personified. They're given the ability to hold on tightly. And this suggests that the commandant cannot escape the horrors of the concentration camp. But what does he do as he leaves the camp and heads home? He will stop at the wayside sweet shop. And once again, we see a juxtaposition here, the pleasant place which contrasts with the horrible concentration camp he works at. He'll pick up some chocolate. So we see juxtaposition of a caring act from a man who tortures and kills for work. And he picks up chocolate for his tender offspring, telling us that this same man who murders, who tortures, has loving children. And so this idea of a loving father is contrasted with the horrendous treatment of prisoners at Belsen. And his children are waiting at home for daddy's return. And the poet has specifically chosen the word daddy because it's a term of endearment. It's ironic that a man who tortures and kills at work can be a family man. Okay, so we see that the commandant causes suffering at work, but he stops to buy sweets for his children in stanza three. This reminds us of the vultures in stanza one who were caring towards one another, but were also capable of horrible things. What we should ask ourselves here is, who's worse, the humans or the vultures? After telling us three different stories, one of the vultures, second of love, third of the commandant from a Nazi camp, stanza four leaves us with two choices. The first, he says, praise bounteous providence, if you will, that grants even an ogre a tiny glowworm tenderness encapsulated in icy cavern of a cruel heart. So praise God or nature, whoever is responsible for generously giving kindness to the world because they've granted kindness to an ogre. So we see a metaphor here. The commandant from this Nazi camp is compared to an ogre to illustrate that he's a monstrous and cruel person. But he's been granted a tiny glowworm of tenderness, right? So the metaphor here, the kindness in the commandant's heart is compared to a glowworm, suggesting that he only has a small amount of goodness inside him. And then we see um, that it's encapsulated in icy caverns of a cruel heart. So once again, the commandant's heart here is compared to an icy cave, which suggests that he's a cold-hearted and ruthless person. Option one is praise God that there is a little bit of good in evil people. 
or our option two, it says, or else despair, for in the very germ of that kindred love is lodged the perpetuity of evil. So option two is telling us, give up, mourn, because even where good exists, it's surrounded by evil. Despair for the very germ of that kindred love. So germ, here we're not talking about a virus, but a germ cell, which is the initial stage of development in certain cells. And so the very beginning of that kindred love, and we see kindred means relating to family, is lodged in the perpetuity of evil. So the, the beginning of kindness here is surrounded by constant evil. So it ends off on a very bleak note, suggesting that the situation is hopeless because the little kindness that this man has for his family is outweighed by the evil acts he commits on a daily basis. And we see the last word in this poem is evil. It's a reminder that evil is always present. And unlike the vultures, this man has a choice. He chooses to act in an evil way. He's not just following his animal instincts. He has a conscience. So he is the true evil. But we see that all three stories tie together to give us our final two choices of should we praise God that there's a little bit of good in evil people or should we despair because even where good exists, it's surrounded by evil. So the theme here we see is that evil is ever present. People are worse than animals who are considered to be savage and people can commit evil acts and go home with a clear conscience. We also see that there's a strange coexistence of evil and love and also that humans have almost a paradoxical nature where they have the capacity to love intensely but at the same time they are capable of unspeakable evil acts. If you found this video helpful please hit like, subscribe, don't forget to share and check out my channel for more videos.